All right, welcome into another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. We got a fun episode today, and it's a one of the disciplines that is probably under talked about, if you will, but it's so, so important, especially in running a company. And for you listening, you are probably in some type of a leadership role. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to tie it to the Harmonious Business Architecture. Um, we have a unique conversation for sure. The title is How to Choose Confidence in Love, Life, and Leadership. And I, I love this topic. I'm super excited to introduce our guest. Real quick for us at What If, I just want to let you know, again, we do have a workshop coming up. If you go to whatif.com slash navigate, you can hear all about that workshop. It's really how we reframe strategic planning. We're going into a new year. We got a new set of 12 months if you want to look at it that way. And we want you to make sure that you and your business thrive through these next 12 months. So go check out whatif.com slash navigate. Get your strategic planning all set up for the year. Enough about me. That's already too much. Let's talk to our guest, Desiree. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Brandon. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. So we're talking about confidence in love, life, and particularly leadership throughout um, all levels of business. And I'm, I'm curious to just dive right in. What is it about your company that makes you different in terms of leadership, coaching, and consulting? I think a lot of people still focus on leadership in the management sense of you need these skills and you need to know these processes and these practices. And we're not looking enough at the personal development of the actual human in their ability to have social intelligence and emotional intelligence and to work their way through hard times and trials because they're going to come. We can't avoid them. And so if you build those skills prior to something happening, you're going to be able to get through it a lot more effectively and efficiently than if you're just working on if the skills if the day is good mm. yeah now i always like to to see where are we what does your company do but now i'm curious how did we get here so tell me about what does your career look like up until this point because i know this is a fairly new venture for you so how did you stumble upon this career path well, I literally stumbled into it because I, after waitressing and thinking that my four-year management degree was a complete waste of time, I went into a job in healthcare, which I had been in for 10 years and didn't want to be in anymore. And the assistant job that I applied for turned into the housing management position um, because I had a management degree, despite the fact that I was very unqualified to lead people. And so um, I was terrible at it. For an entire year, I I think people feared me and uh, people, you know, were terrified when I walked into the room that I was going to point out what was wrong and tell them how to fix it. I was great with, um, you know, the people that I was serving, but not with the people that I was leading. And so I knew it. But when you're leading out of fear, it's very hard to come out of. And I know that fear was the driving factor now in hindsight, but it's a lot harder when you're in the thick of it to understand that. And so during COVID, we all hit, you know, a roadblock. I had to be at work because we were in healthcare. There was no other option. Um, but I had also just had a baby. My daughter was three months old. So I was dealing with that at home and my husband staying home with her because there was no daycare. I had to do something because when you hit that roadblock, you know, you, you hit the bottom and all of a sudden you have to start building your way back up. So I started reading personal development to try and lose weight and it all changed from there. The personal development, I chose weight loss as my vessel to learn these things and to apply them and to tweak them to what worked for me. But it all rolled over into my relationships, into my work life, into my leadership capabilities. It, it changed everything. Yeah, that's, that's so great. And it's, it's a story that, I'm sure you've heard, I've heard a number of times is once you start improving yourself, your whole life kind of starts to fall into place, which is a great problem to have. Um, but I want to go back a little bit. You said something you were leading out of fear. At first, I want to clarify, you were in fear or you were using fear as the motivating driver to get your staff to do what you wanted them to do? I was leading out of fear. Okay. Um, so can you talk <laughs> a little bit about, because I think a lot of people are there and like you said, the other people in your life and that you are leading recognize that, but they definitely don't have 
uh, the confidence to tell you about it and help you fix it. How do you recognize that when you're in that state um, and you, you are leading in that manner? How do you first as the leader recognize that you're there and you need to change? It's all about asking the right questions because if I would have asked myself, why am I walking in with a hammer ready to drop every time that I encounter one of my employees? And it was because I was afraid that they were doing something wrong that would come back on me because it was essentially my responsibility for them to be successful. I was scared people were going to find out that I was not qualified to be in the position that I was in. I was honestly terrified to admit to myself that I was not ready to be where I was and I wasn't qualified. So when I say I was leading out of fear, it was fear in a 360 degree fashion of it appeared as though I was angry or frustrated, but it was really that I was scared to do something wrong. And so I was micromanaging so that everyone else appeared to be doing things right. Mm. So I'm hearing a lot of imposter syndrome was present. Yeah. When you're, and it, it's not just about being young and it's not just about being new. I, I've had clients that are 30 years into their leadership journey and they are still terrified. They are terrified that if they give some of their work to someone else, they're going to do it better and take their job. <coughs> Excuse me. They are scared that if they don't do everything right and if they don't stay till 7 p.m. and work on the weekend that their boss is, boss is going to realize they can hire someone cheaper and you know maybe less qualified but just as able to do the job and so it doesn't matter if you're new and your imposter syndrome is coming out of i'm not qualified or if you're an experienced leader and your imposter syndrome is saying i'm no longer the only person that can do this job how do i keep it fear is fear is the opposite of love not hate fear mm -hmm. is where a lot of these leaders are driving what they're doing from because they're scared to, to not do it right yeah, that's, it's interesting that you point that out too, because I think a lot of people, especially as leaders, they, they do fear being in the position and letting themselves down, their family down, their team down, the company. Um, there's, there's so much weighing on you as a leader. So let's talk about the shift then, because you help people develop the confidence to lead in the right manner. Um, now, in the harmonious business architecture, leadership, which we call inspire, because we believe that's the job of a leader is to inspire their team to take action and chase the mission of the company. So in the inspired discipline, it touches seven other disciplines. So we know there's more at play than just optimizing the leader, but that is the first step. So tell me a little bit from your perspective and what you do with your clients. How do you develop confidence in leaders so they can go out and inspire? It is all about your willingness to trust yourself. I will tell anybody who asks that leadership starts with yourself. And once you have found a way to do what you say you're going to do and to trust that you're not going to let yourself down, that's when you get to start adding value to other people. You know, there's the cliches of you have to fill your own cup first and you have to put on your, your face mask first. It's the same thing. If you are not allowing yourself to get all of the personal development that you can, you're not going to be able to share that with other people, the encouragement and the positivity and the optimism that comes from knowing that you can get through anything that comes your way because of the work that you've put into yourself. You're not going to be able to share that with someone if you don't truly believe it yourself. Yeah, no, that's, that's something we hear. And do we act on it? I don't know. Do we always fill our cup first so that we can give and inspire effectively? Um, that's probably a question that we need to ask ourselves. But do you have, when you work with people, do you have a formula, a roadmap, a strategy to, to follow? Or is it kind of case by case scenario? I do. But, you know, it ultimately is case by case because it's when you start asking the right questions that people are surprised by their own answers. You know, they think that they're so massively busy and they have no time for hobbies or to, they don't love what they're doing. But when you get down to it, it's 
someone is volunteering and that's taking their time. But when you ask them what they like to do with their time, they say, give back to others. So it's truly a mindset shift of you're not doing this because you have to, you're doing it because you love it. It also just happens to be helping someone else, but developing the ability to fill your cup first truly comes from realizing that it's not a selfish act. We are conditioned in this day and age to think that unless we are 100% productive all the time and giving everything that we have to everyone else and being perfect at it, that we're not doing enough. We're not good enough. I am the first person to tell you that you need to take space for yourself. And that doesn't mean solidarity. Space doesn't mean that you're sitting there alone. Space means that you are turning on an exercise video and allowing your kids to join you. It means you're reading a personal development book and having that be the driver for the conversation that you're having with your friends and that you're having with your spouse. It means creating space for you to cultivate relationships in your community or online, whatever it might look like. So I say the word space and people say, well, I don't have time to be alone. I never said you did. I said you need to create space for the things that are important to you and invite the people who are you who are important to you to join that space. By you creating that, you're giving someone else the opportunity to be a part of that optimism and that positivity that you have because you are doing what you say you're going to do and you're following through on the goals that you set for yourself. Yeah, and I think that's something that that gets leaders in particular because we feel like we have to be all things to all people, whether it's our team or our families or our communities. And really, you need to prioritize the relationships and spending your time in, in places that do fill up your cup, like you're saying. I mean, I, I remember when I, this was a couple of years ago, went through uh, a couple months of burnout from overworking and, and people pleasing and all this stuff. When I look back at it, it's because I was saying yes to the wrong things and no to the right things. And that's, it just drains you. So for me, as, as an introvert, I did need personal space, quiet time by myself, mm -hmm. but extroverts need people time. So it's like you're saying, it's finding the right place for you to recharge. And I think that's, that's so important. So um, I want to put your website on the screen here so people can reach out if they need help with their leadership um, and, and developing themselves. I, I would love for them to contact you. Now, who typically contacts you? Is it the company looking to develop their leaders or is it the actual individual who, who needs help or both? That's an interesting question because most of the time it's the individual who contacts me and I will come back at them and say, if you want to pay for it yourself, great, but this is not meant to be covered by you. Mm. This is meant to be something your company is offering to you and wanting to develop you and grow you into this leader. It is so mostly what I do is do workshops with teams because I truly think that there's something so amazing about showing appreciation and really getting back to basics within a team to say, we're all thinking the same thing. We just don't say it out loud. So that's one huge piece of what I do. The other piece is group coaching. I do it in person and online. There is nothing I love more than cultivating community because realizing that you're not alone in those struggles is the number one step to feeling like there's actually something to, to do about it, to know that you're not alone is the number one step. And only two of my seven pillars have the word lead in it, leadership in it. Most of the pillars that I have are cultivating a community. How are you going to enter spaces and create spaces that people who are going to mutually benefit one another, how do you create that? And it's about overcoming and evaluating your excuses that you're telling yourself because you're giving your power away to something that you create it. And it's turning your pain into purpose. I mean, I've had more pain in the last two years than I had the rest of my 30 years combined. And although my family members didn't necessarily come out of it, I found a way because I had been developing myself over the course of the past five years to not only overcome it, but to thrive through it. Yeah, that's a powerful message. And I think that's to focus on the word pain, I think, could be misleading because your pain as a leader could be anything. It, it could be whatever you're suffering with without telling somebody else, that's your pain. It, it does not have to be the, the public image of what we typically look at struggles, if you will, as. So if you are dealing with any of this, I want you to reach out. 
the website's on the screen, DesireePetrix.com. This has been a phenomenal conversation. Um, let's just tie this to the harmonious architecture real quick. I already mentioned Inspire. We are obviously talking about leadership, but the flip side of that, and one of the areas that leadership always touches is home. It's your people, humans optimized in a meaningful environment. If you are not showing up as the leader you need to be, your team is not gonna follow you and you're gonna have and build a culture that is actually taking away from the potential of your company. So those are the two areas that for me are most prevalent in this conversation. Um, but if you wanna learn more, if you wanna help yourself and your team grow, please reach out. Desiree is a phenomenal resource. Desiree, thank you so much for joining me today. And you mentioned community, where can people find you? Are you on social media anywhere? Yep, um, LinkedIn and Instagram at Desiree Petrick. Fantastic. We'll put those in the show notes. Well, thank you again for joining me. This has been such a fun episode and a, again, a very, very important conversation. So reach out if you want to develop your leadership and yourself as a human being, and I'll see you next time on the next episode of Harmonious at Lunch.